Hello, we're back for yet another day of Advent of Code, and this one, we're playing a bit of bingo! Uh, so this is probably the first problem where I think the parsing is a little bit more complicated than what we've seen in the past, uh, or in the past couple of days, and so I'm going to show you how I walked through, or how I solved this problem, and maybe give you some ideas about how you can approach this. Uh, okay, so taking a look at our problem, uh, we have kind of two types of inputs. We have the input numbers, these are the ones that are going to be called for our bingo game, and then we have a series of bingo boards. Um, and one thing that I noticed while looking at this input is each of these are separated by a blank line, which is two uh, new line characters. And so I'm going to probably use that fact when parsing. Uh, for part one, we are going to call out the numbers in order, and when the first bingo board wins, so it either has, you know, in this case, not diagonals, <laughs> Uh, a row or a column has all the numbers filled out, uh, then that bingo board has one, and the answer for that is going to be the uh, remaining numbers multiplied by the number that was just called. And uh, I probably should have uh, grabbed the expected values for those. Let me do that real quick. Spoilers, don't look at that. 45, 1, 2 and 1924 okay cool just put that back in here uh, expected is 4512 and expected is 1924 okay cool so the first thing that i want to do with this is start parsing our inputs and i am basically going to split off this one chunk here from the rest of the chunks here and so we're going to do first and rest is equal to input s dot split and as I said before, we're going to split on two new line characters. This is going to allow us to separate this first line from the rest of the lines. Now, when I was thinking about this problem, uh, I wanted to represent the board using some sort of data structure. So we're going to make a custom data structure. Um, just because it's easy, I'm going to use name tuple. <laughs> it's actually not a really good use of name tuple because I'm going to be using mutable values, things that can be changed. Uh, but this lets me get a real quick class. I could also use you know data classes or adders or whatever the heck else I wanted to use. Um, so let's make a class here, and that is going to represent our board. And I kind of wanted to represent the state in, in sort of two ways. We need a way to know whether these numbers have been picked yet, and we need to know the position of these numbers so that we can access them in order. And of course I could use like a two-dimensional array and then like you know, when we call the numbers, we have to iterate and find the right spot. That, that's kind of slow, so I wanted to make sure that uh, calling the numbers is as quick as possible. And so I initially represented whether the numbers had been called by a dictionary that mapped each of these numbers to a Boolean. Um, but whenever I see dictionary mapping thing to Boolean, I usually rethink and I'm like, oh wait, that's just a set. So we're going to use a set for this instead. Uh, set of integers, and I'm going to uh, consider these as just the ones that are left over. So if they got called, they're not going to be in this set. Uh, initially, it's going to start with everything in this set. Oh, I don't have water. Dang it. Oh, well. Um, we also need to know the positions of these, and uh, I did kind of a little bit of a confusing thing. I'm going to show you the confusing thing I did, but then make a better recommendation here. Uh, I actually just represented the positions of these as one big long array. Um, instead of having a two-dimensional array, and then did some index math to figure out the actual positions in things. I wouldn't recommend that. I would recommend instead having kind of a two-dimensional array where you plot out all the positions of these. Um, but I just had a list of integers. That's how I represented mine. Um, and we, we want to be able to parse these. So let's start by making a class method for parsing these. And from future import annotations because I am going to make this a method which takes a board string uh, stir and that will return back our board and the reason I did annotations is because otherwise this is going to be a naming error here uh, fortunately parsing these is pretty easy we're going to be basically given a string that looks like this and that's what is in here this star is a collector so it's basically Take the first line and then all of the rest of the chunks, these each uh, end up as their own array or list here. And uh, we're going to use a cool little trick of Python here where 
if we have uh, a string like this, we can call split on that, and that's going to split on white space. This also includes new lines. Uh, so if we have a new line in the middle, it's still going to treat it as white space. And so we don't really care whether there are spaces here or if there are multiple spaces or if there are new lines. Split is going to handle that all for us. We don't have to do any sort of magic there. So we're going to say int equals int uh, s for, well, let's call this board instead, for s in board dot split. And so this does really easy parsing of all those integers for us. And we also want that left set, and that is just going to be a set of all of our integers. So then we can do return class uh, left int. And that's kind of our parsing here. So let's go down here and let's actually parse those boards. Boards equals board.parse uh, board for board in rest. Cool, so that should get us parsed here. Oh, that, that should get us the boards parsed. We also need to parse these integers. Uh, ints equals ints s for s in first dot split, and those are comma separated. Cool, so we can get all of those. Let's just print those to see what we have so far. Uh, we have our ints, and let's print our boards. And kind of hard to see, but I guess we have those. <laughs> cool, we're gonna, we're gonna call that good enough. Uh, so now let's get to the actual uh, bit of the problem that we have to implement. So we're gonna call off numbers one at a time. And if, or once we find a board that has one, we are going to return back this uh, multiplied number. Did it say that? Multiply the uncalled numbers by the called number. Uh, so we're basically gonna do for number in hence. And we need to make sure that this number gets called on each board. Now, fortunately, since we're using a set here, this is really easy. We just discard the number from the set and you know, that'll, that'll make it called for us. So we're gonna do for board in boards and we can just do board.left.discard number. And the cool thing about the discard method on sets is if the number isn't contained, it just does nothing. So we don't have to check whether it's there, we can just fire and not really worry about it. So this is this is all we need to do to call the number in here, but now we need to check if the board has one. And for that, I made a property here. Um, it has one, and that's going to return a Boolean here. Now for this, we need to check all of the rows, and we need to check all of the columns. And so the way I thought about that is we're going to have kind of like an I and a J to walk through each of those. For I in range 5, our boards are 5 by 5. And we also need for J in range 5. Uh, so this is going to check each of one dimension, and then J is going to check the other dimension. Uh, and we can do it in both directions. And in order for something to be 1, we need to check whether the each of these integers is no longer in this set here and fortunately we have kept track of those integers inside of here and this is where like i'm going to use some confusing math and you would probably instead do this using a two-dimensional array uh, so if self dot ins let's say that we're doing rows first so we're going to do i times five to represent our our row position uh, so for the zeroth row, it starts at zero. For the first row, it's gonna be offset by five. For the second row, it's offset by 10, because we just have one big long list of integers. Plus j. Uh, if the integer at that position is in self.left, we know that we have not won this particular row. Uh, so we can just do break, and we're gonna break out of this loop and not bother checking the rest of that row. But if we had somehow gotten through this entire row and not missed any of the numbers, we know that we have one bingo and we can use for else to do return true. Uh, this is a little bit of a tricky syntax. The else block only fires if everything in here doesn't break. Uh, and so we know, you know, we know we've, we've mashed in that case. Uh, that handles the rows. Let's do the columns next for j in range five. And we're gonna use some more <laughs> It's more of this <laughs> kind of annoying math here, but bear with me. Uh, so we're going to instead do i plus 5 times j. 
Uh, so we're going to do the zeroth column, then the first column, then the second column, then the third, and then the fourth column. Or, yeah, you get what I mean. Um, and actually, that's kind of cool. The, the math here looks very similar to both those in self.left. We're going to use the same break, uh, break trick as before, else return true. Uh, and if we don't match anything at all, we're going to return false at the end. And so this is how I implemented my check for whether we won. And again, note that we don't have to bother with diagonals. Oh, I spelled diagonal wrong here. Diagonal. <laughs> Someone's probably screaming at their screen. Ah, diagonal, it's spelled wrong. Post down in the comments if I spelled something else wrong. <laughs> okay, so now we need to do for board in boards. If board dot has one, then um, then we print out the number that we have got. So, uh, and what is it? Sum all of the uncalled numbers by the called numbers. So we can do, uh, <laughs> we're just gonna, so the way, the way I actually had this implemented was in a function. And I guess we can do that here just because it will uh, allow us to do return instead of raise here. Return board so we want the sum of the things that are left times the number that called to implement this yep and uh, uh we'll put a raise not implemented error here or assertion error because we shouldn't ever hit this unreachable print get number and yeah some summing the numbers that are left is really easy because we picked a set data set before and we multiply this here and let's run that let's see if we are Good. Uh, Python three t dot pi four five one two. That is exactly what we expect. Okay, cool. So that's part one, uh, where we stop on the first thing that gets hit. Part two is a little bit different. Part two asks us to play out every single number and find what the last winner is. Uh, so let's take. <laughs> well, since we're mutating our input because we have sets here, uh, we can't really reuse this. So take a mental note of what this looks like. Actually, we can just copy paste that, right? We will just leave this down below. Uh, oops, I forgot to unmute Discord. Oops, my bad, sorry. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> okay, that's part one down there. Uh, so let's do part two. So in part two, we want the last one that wins. So basically we need to keep track of the last winner. And at the end, return that value. Return last winner. However, as soon as one of the boards has won, it's just gonna completely co continually count as winning and eventually have all of its squares filled up and have the wrong numbers. We, we need to make sure as soon as we find a board that's won, we don't continually recount it. So we need to have some sort of set that is all of the boards that we've seen so far, and we need a way to mark them as seen. Uh, all right, I'm getting ahead of myself. Last winner equals this. And we need a way to mark them as seen. Unfortunately, we can't stick our name tuples into a set because they are mutable themselves. So we need another way to represent them. Uh, one way would be the ID of the board, or we can just use the index of the board. And I think that's probably the easiest way to do this. So if we enumerate instead, uh, then we can say if, if I not in seen, so if we haven't seen this board's index before, and it has one, then we set the last winner, and we do scene.addi. And so that'll make sure that we don't recount the same board that we've already seen. Uh, and that should work. Yeah, cool. All right, so that's our part two and part one. Um, but I, I found this problem pretty interesting. Uh, let's talk about the runtime of both of these solutions. So, we're looping over the number of integers. So we, we kind of have two numbers here. We have the number of integers, which I'll say is n, and the number of boards, which is m. Um, and this loop here is going to pretty much always be o n, and this has to be o m, so you multiply those together. So this, this part at least is o n times m. Uh, we then do another loop over all of the boards, and um, actually probably could have combined these two loops now that I think about it. Doesn't really matter. Just small code simplification there. Uh, this has one function is actually a little bit more complex. It is constant time because these loops are constant. So it may be a big constant, but it's constant time. Um, and none of this is 
that interesting. So overall, this is O of n times m, and we use O of <laughs> o of m space, I guess, because m is probably bigger than n. Um, I guess we have n plus m space, so whichever one's bigger, we use that much space. Uh, but yeah, I thought this was kind of a cool problem. Um, my initial solution to this was really messy, so this is actually an improved version, uh, but there's further improvements, especially in this range here. Like Representing this as a two-dimensional array is going to simplify this a lot, but as long as you have some way to keep it in your head, that's what's important. Anyway, uh, hopefully you enjoyed this, and I'll see you for the next day.